Hello, everyone, and welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Today, we're speaking with Shreya Jen. Shreya is the CEO and founder of Reservoir, India's largest digital community of people with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Welcome to the show, Shreya. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're excited to have you here. So I understand your inspiration for starting Reservoir is your younger brother. He has autism. And could you tell us about him? What is his name and how old is he? Right. So my brother is my inspiration for starting this company. His name is Suvrat and he's 20 years old. And he, he got diagnosed when he was two and a half and he lives with my parents it's pretty mm-hmm. great, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's 20. You're 25, right? I'm 25. Could mm-hmm. you paint us a picture of the landscape of autism in India? Like, what are the attitudes around autism and what services are available to families? Right. Um, so, first of all, I think it's not a uniform landscape. There are different levels of acceptance, in fact, different levels of awareness across the country. Um, depending on, you know, what kind of community you belong to, what kind of city you're living in, what kind of access to information you have. Um, But more or less, I think we have a very long way to go in terms of understanding and generalizing the concept of different abilities and neurodiversity across the country. My brother, when he was diagnosed at two and a half, I think my family did not know what autism meant, Mm. right? And this Mm -hmm. was 18 years ago. And I think if I were to ask a lot of people around me, even like people who go to college and, you know, just educated people, a lot of people don't truly understand what it is, which really, really surprises me and shocks me, right? So I don't know where we're going wrong, but I think if we've not met the first step of knowing what it is, the infrastructure around for support and help obviously lags and gets and is staggering behind because of that. But nonetheless, we have, for the community, I mean, credit where it's due, we have progressed a lot in the last decade as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've learned a lot from what's happening in the West, you know, culturally adapted it and seen, like, and, uh, to see how it fits here. So now we have special schools, we have lo- a lot of therapy coming in. We also have some amount of ABA that's, start, like, that's starting to trickle in, which is a very, very new concept. But... Even like um, more advanced therapies like music therapy, art therapy are slowly gaining uh, some attention and some popularity. But I think what's most important is that we're finally going out there and talking about it. I think that's my favorite part. Like I am, you know, families around me are are willing to talk about it now out in the open. Um, And I think that's where we're at. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So back, you know, 18 years ago, what was it like for your family? Well, first, where did, how did they notice that your brother might be different? What made them want um, to go seek help? So it was mostly my mom because she um, was the one spending maximum amount of time with him. She observed, and of course, I've this is all like hearsay now because I was very very young myself. Um, but from what I remember is that my brother had a decent amount of speech before this happened. So, you know, and he would speak three different, like, words in three different languages. So he would speak some amount of English to me, some amount of Hindi to my parents, and some amount of Punjabi, which is our native language, um, to my grandparents. So it was very interesting to see how he'd learned um, different, uh, what language works for different kind of people in the family. And he was very, very intelligent, right? So, and he also had... uh, learned if he couldn't like his own style of communication with everybody which sort of started to um, go down after about a fever after that we started observing that he was staying more aloof he wasn't interacting with people as much and his uh, speech was also deteriorating and I think at that point my mom said that I think this is a little more than just a child recovering from fever you know I think I know him well enough to know uh, that this is not regular fever recovery for him. This is something more. And in the beginning, she got a lot of backlash for that as well, where everybody around me was like, no, you know, you're just putting too much pressure on the child. Like, why can't you let him be? You're being crazy. You know, you need help. Your child doesn't need help. So it was all sorts of 
reactions and of course they all came from a very protective place it wasn't easy to get help at that point of time um and then eventually i think my finally my mom took like she took a stand she's like no but you know like we have to do this so initially uh, i when we went to the doctors in chandigarh which is where i'm from i don't think anybody knew what they were talking about nobody knew like some of the doctors also called my mom crazy that you're just obsessing over your child right like because you have nothing better to do so uh, it was very hard for my mom to still keep fighting and figuring out the right answers and then eventually i think i don't even remember which doctor this was but somebody said that oh your child might have autism and my mom at that point probably had no idea what that meant but eventually she got redirected to um um a, sc- a school which is now a very very big school in delhi called action for autism um she was redirected there and there she sort of found more help and then i don't remember the exact sequence to be honest but it was a combination of people in delhi a combination of people in bombay finally like i think it was like a few months after when we finally figured out and sort of you know came to terms with that this is something that's lifelong this is something that we all need to like like deal with but i remember it was it was still like in that moment it wasn't like uh you know of course it was terrifying but we were all taking it in our stride we were all doing what we needed to do to 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 be there for each other and to support each other like i remember uh, we mo- my mom moved to delhi because there was absolutely no kind of help available in chandigarh at that time so you know we like i would go to delhi with with my dad over the weekends to to, to spend time with him and my mom would come back so it was it was it was difficult but i think we were all like making the best of the situation and the best of resources of what we had eventually when my mom came back to chandigarh and you know we tried to like get him admissions in schools um he he was shown out of multiple schools multiple mainstream schools even though he was doing really really well right like he used to love going to school but just i think more than anything else the the principals the staff the parents around would just find it extremely absurd and I don't know you know just when, when there's no awareness what was he doing what sorry what was he doing that was absurd what was making him stand out there are slight differences in behavior um to an atypical to from for an atypical child uh, to a child who has autism to, to a typical child right like so i think just those minor differences and just the fact that everybody knew that he was different mm-hmm. was scaring them a little bit mm-hmm. so at that point i remember it wasn't even like he wasn't doing well or he wasn't coping well he was doing beautifully and we were just happy that he was going to a, a school where he had friends and you know where he had like A, a schedule that was close to normal like that was so important for us in that in that moment mm-hmm. um and you know initially he was going to the same school that I went to now that i think about it i had i had gone to the same school and so uh, that school has been so important to me because those are your initial forming years right and we wanted the same for my brother and when he could not have that i think it really set us back a few steps and i feel like that is when we sort of got rejected again and again and again and that forced us to think about things very differently because up till then we were like okay this is fine he is different yeah so what you know so what but i think when we were put down so many times by people around us that you're forced to sort of i mean then you get then you it's not so easy to always keep your spirits up right so i guess that's what happened but then mm-hmm. eventually we found a smaller school which was not as fancy and not as big and not as uptight i guess and they were very very accommodating of sovereign in fact you know as he grew older then the only thing was that he was the tallest kid in his class <laughs> like that was the <laughs> that was the odd thing but still the school is like i think like that school is called rainbow i'll never forget that school because consistently for all his uh, annual days sovereign would become a tree <laughs> because that all <laughs> he was so tall that's the only participation in annual school in annual days but it was really nice so you know we found support in the most unexpected ways in the most unexpected forms but also got rejected from places we you know we were confident that we will find help yeah yeah uh, you know i just want to point out to that your mother is um very involved with the global autism project can you sure. just give a little bit of a background of um what she's doing at sorum school right so i think my mom started Uh, working at Sarum, I want to say ten years ago. I'm not maybe more now. 
10 I years ago? More. Is that what you said? Yeah, I think more than 10. Mm-hmm. Shit, I should know this. <laughs> um, she started there as a volunteer and it was only because we found the school and we absolutely loved it the principal over there Mrs. Pramila Chandra Mohan she's just an amazing woman and I think more than anything else you just feel very loved there right so my mom said okay fine you know this is one place I feel like I'm home it's okay it doesn't matter no- nothing else matters and she started there as a volunteer and slowly and slowly she became a part of that family along with my brother. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she also went on to uh, pursue her studies, pursuing her studies in this field. So she did her um, B.E. in special education and autism and she took on a larger role eventually. And I think this is also when she came across um, the Global Autism Project and um, they formed a partnership. And I think ever since then, the face of Sorum has also evolved exponentially, right? Mm-hmm. I think the exposure that we got because of the Global Autism Project, it was, I think more than, it, it re-energized everybody. It was, it was the sense of hope almost that, like, you know, just dream bigger. Like, don't limit yourself to, to feeling loved, set bigger goals for yourself. And I think that was very, very beautiful because till now we were like, oh, there's nothing Here's a school that makes you feel loved. And that's great, right? So I think we'd almost settled there. And as great as that was, I feel like it was amazing to sort of for someone to come along and say, but you know what? Why don't you dream bigger? Like, you got here and now it's possible for you to go to the next step. And I think my mom and Molly and the entire Global Autism Project team sort of made that happen for Mm Sarum. Because now look at them. You know, they're looking at vocational programs. They're looking at, like, they're thinking about employment programs and... You know, the way they collect data for their students has changed. They've digitalized so many things. Yeah. So it's it's absolutely beautiful. Like the mm-hmm. Sendai journey has been growing and evolving very nicely. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Shreya, the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You know, thinking about your mom dreaming big and being this kind of go-getter, like I can see that in you too. You know, being a CEO at 25, you know, all of that you've accomplished so far. You know, I feel like when I was finishing my MBA and every time I would look at Molly and when I would look at entrepreneurs, including my mom, including my dad, you know, I'm surrounded by all of these energetic people. I would, I would be so fascinated by them that you have the, this opportunity to create something. And now that, I, now that I'm actually doing it myself, at least in some parts, I think it's not, it's, it's, so, it's so much more than just, I don't know how to explain it. Right? It's, it's, so, so, it's so fulfilling and wholesome to be able to create something and see it like from like it's a sapling right now, but you know, there was a point when it was just a seed. So it's just to be able to see something grow in front of your own eyes and know that you're contributing to the growth of something is absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I want to get more into the work that you're doing at Reservoir, but let's backtrack a little bit. Sorry, I led us in a different direction, but... I want to ask you how it was for you growing up. You know, when your brother was diagnosed, you were very young. What was going on in your head? When did you start to realize also what autism was and how was it affecting you? Um, I think when I was, when the diagnosis just happened, I think when I was, when my brother was born, I was obsessed with him. I was absolutely obsessed with him. So I would, I remember I would, um, swing him on my hip and like carry him around and it was so funny because my parents would all, were always scared that how is this child not crying or mm-hmm. feeling uncomfortable or whatever right so we were attached to the hip quite literally <laughs> <laughs> so um but you know I think at that time when I realized that he needed help or he needed something more I was I was like fine you know we're gonna get him whatever he needs even as a child I was like sure sure you know you have to move to Delhi I'll stay on my own it's absolutely fine right so I think I was a. I, I think it also made me grow up really, really fast because I had no option. Mm-hmm. And then I remember when I was in my teenage, there was a little bit of resentment because I, I, at that point I was like, "Where is my piece of attention? You know, what am I getting? Like mm-hmm. everything's about him." And so I think uh, in those years, it took me a little bit longer to come back and realize that you know, my parents didn't mean any harm or, you know, he didn't mean any harm. So there was a phase where 
we weren't so attached to the hip where we were like I was like fine I I have my friends I have my cousins it's cool right mm-hmm. so i think i was being really distant and then i don't know he has you know it's i guess it's with people who are differently able they have this blessing that they don't sort of hold things against you because i know if i would have like distanced myself from any other friend for that long they would have probably just walked away from me right mm-hmm. but i think for my brother like the minute i i, I wanted to go back to him and sort of rekindle our friendship he was very open to it and i don't think he ever sort of made me feel bad about it for not being there in the middle or being absent minded about it right um or being angry at him in fact i was angry for a very very long time um, when was it that you tried to um like rekindle your friendship if you will? so we've had phases to be honest uh, okay. like there was one time when i remember we we just shifted houses so i'd uh, finally and so we had also come back for like good now you know he was in the, we were in the same city long enough so we had a chance to spend some time with each other and he was also surprisingly taking up to sports really well which was beautiful cuz i'm a i've always been into sports and when we got to do something together that we really liked instead of me having to do something with him for him you know it now we finally had a common interest and a common goal which which really really helped us so we you know we i taught him how to cycle with my mom i taught him how to skate we taught him how to swim um you know we would we would go in the park a lot at that time we made some friends together so it so that was really nice but then again we moved houses and you know this friend circle broke apart my studies got harder again when i was in my 11th grade or 12th grade i think then again i had this phase that i was like whatever yeah i don't care about you but then i think the next sense of realization happened when i had to choose where i had to go for college where i had to go for university and i was i got admission in uh, a college in the uk I got into nottingham and i said okay fine i'm going to leave and then when we were sitting and discussing what this would mean for us as a family i think that's when it hit me that if i move apart now well i don't know when i'm going to come back and what does that mean for me and my brother right will we be able to survive this really long patch of being apart and i think that's just being able to think like that and think about him in that moment yeah um uh, maybe feel like no i deeply deeply cared about him and I think ever since then there's sort of been no doubt because that came very naturally that was something that my parents didn't have to tell me to do or nobody forced that upon me mm-hmm. and I think it's not been the same ever since like it's it's even though we don't meet I feel like my brother also has started showing affection towards me in a manner that he didn't before so even though we meet we meet for brief periods when I go back it's it's way more meaningful than than it was in the middle mm-hmm. and i think now i am at a point in my life where and i don't think that everybody needs to do this but i think i'm at a point in my life where whatever decisions i take for my future i like to think about him from the start right because mm-hmm. i want to be close to him it's not like i have to take care of him or my parents are imposing any kind of responsibility but it it just makes me feel nice about who i am when i'm around him right it makes me feel like my most authentic truest self in a weird way and my most childish self when i'm around him which i don't get to be otherwise like otherwise i'm running a company i have to be really strict and straight forward and you know yeah. all of those other things but when i'm around him i'm like a child and i really 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 enjoy that side of me mhm so <laughs> yeah it sounds like you guys have a really good relationship now Yeah we do. It's it's really really nice. In fact, you know now my um he Suvrit so makes a lot of interesting vocational items like wind chimes. He does a lot of weaving so he makes a lot of stuff. So now he's cold pressing oils. He's all over the place. Mm. Um but I I also like whatever little bit I can do right just in helping my mom promote all of those products in helping them set up an Instagram page. Just like small things which I can do from here. I really I think that's also helped us maintain our connection even though he doesn't probably realize it's been through that but i'm in a way connected to what he's doing at all times yeah so it's it's really nice mhm so you mentioned that you you got an mba um, yeah i studied in engin- i did my chemical engineering and then i did my mba mhm um yeah man i was i was studying to be 
um, a part of the pharmaceutical industry. I don't know how I got here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a big leap from pharmaceuticals, like engineering to autism advocacy. Yeah. What was the was, path for that? I think like many other things in this world, it was the Global Autism Project. <laughs> 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 no, seriously, like, um, so in my final year of MBA, uh, I was talking to the Global Autism Project team and I was helping them on a project um, called the Accelerated Business Academy, which was very interesting because I got to apply my MBA firsthand into a project that would make a difference in the real world. And, you know, as, an, as a student, you don't, it's very rarely that you get to do that. You're otherwise just working as an intern, which basically has... No meaning, <laughs> usually, mm-hmm. like, right? But I was, right. I think I was very excited by that. It, ha- it, it will make, um, it's of significance. So I think after I got done with college, um, I had the opportunity to go to New York for three and a half months to actually uh, implement what we created together. But while I was there, I think I, the exposure that I had to the infrastructure, to the kind of ecosystem that exists in other parts of the world for people who have autism, for people who are differently abled, I think that just blew my mind, right? And that made me so uncomfortable, Rachel, like just being there for three and a half months. Like there have been times when I've just gone home and cried because I couldn't imagine that life for my family, for my friends, for my friends who are on the spectrum ever here, at least not anytime soon. And I think that insane amount of discomfort sort of made me take the leap, but it just pushed me over the edge. So I I had to come back to a job which I'd gotten through my college, through my university, and I was was supposed to join that. So I think, I mean, because it was all done, so I had to start it. Every morning I would wake up, I would reach that office, and I would hate myself. I would Mm -hmm. absolutely hate myself, right? And I did that for exactly 10 days. And then I was like, nope. (laughs) 10 days? You know, I'm... Yeah, I swear, because I was like, what am I, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving my best to this company that's supposed to pay me. I'm not giving my, my own self, like, the happiness or whatever that it is. So what's the point, right? And everybody yeah. told me at that point that, you know, you don't have enough work experience. Why don't you get some work experience before, like, venturing out on your own? All sorts of things, right? It's just, it's never easy to make a jump or make a switch. And more than anything else, my parents were in absolute and utter shock because it's something that I had been working towards for like, including my high school education, right? Like for seven years in entirety, I'd worked towards this this decision. And they just wanted me to be sure if I was okay with giving that up because obviously this wasn't going to be easy. I I also was so insecure about not being able to make any money on this path where all of my friends would have like careers that would let them travel and, you know, have all these perks. So it was, so it's definitely not easy. And it, it was, but all I'd say is that I'm just happy I wake up every morning now, you know, even if it means not having like the kind of life I could have had then. But what was the point? I, I, I saw that I was, I hated every day of it. I was like, so I'd rather be happy than, you know, choose something that, that, that all of that will come. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, there's so much meaning into the the work you're doing now for you and for everyone around you, the right. community. No, in fact, I mean, look, I think even the pharmaceutical industry, right, if it has such an important part to play in the world, right? And I think mm-hmm. that's what excited me about that as well, just being able to create something that, that so we were, um, we were going to manufacture antibiotics, Right, that right now play a very, very important part in coronavirus. So, yeah. I mean, technically, when I think about it, it's I always have been intrigued by the fact of creating something that sort of generates large-scale impact. And I think the only difference that I needed to realize was that wasn't my journey. Or maybe it was, but I just found, like, more happiness and joy in this other part. Mm-hmm. And when I was able to identify that, I think everything changed. Mm-hmm. How did you come up with the name Reservoir? I think it was when I was explaining to my dad what I wanted to create. Um, And I was telling him, I was like, you know, like, imagine a dam of water. Imagine, like, all of that water that is being stored and is being utilized when there's shortage of rain, right? So I want to create, like, a reservoir of resources for these families. And I think that 
sort of explanation just stuck and that word just stuck from there. So it was, it was um, yeah, I guess that's how that happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, you know, as you're describing it, even these images come in my head, you know, of being this kind of holding space for people. Yeah. That people so can kind I, of dip into. Yeah. I think we just wanted to create, like, I want to create um, a safe space, a safe environment. I think even our logo is a home with leaves around it, which basically signifies, you know, nurturance and growth and just just nature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... Could you describe for us what the process looks like for someone who seeks to connect with Reservoir? Let's say they follow um, on your website. What, what does that look like? So we do, on our website, there are three things that you can do. Um, the first one being, if you're looking for a service, a particular service or a, um, a need, you can go find that through our website. Right now we have three categories, which include... Um, therapy, so you can find different kinds of therapy like speech, occupational, physio, etc. Or you can find some extracurricular activities out there. Um, or you can find um, future security solutions on our website, right? Which basically mean, as an adult, things that you might need or your family might need for your safety and your security, you can find that. The second thing is mostly about, um, is about the inclusion drives and campaigns that we do. So as a company, um, we have done a lot of on-ground advocacy work in different formats. So even if you're a corporate or you're a startup and you want to learn more about how you can contribute or how you can get associated with us, you can get you can be a part of our inclusion drives. And the third thing, the third thing that you can do is simply just get in touch with us for anything that you might want to share. Or if you want to, if there's anything that you'd like to know and for us to discuss with you, then you can also leave us a message there. Apart we, from that, we also, like, we're very, very active on all our social media channels because I think that's the easiest way to spread the message. So we have a YouTube channel, we have Instagram, we have LinkedIn, we have Facebook, we have we're all over. Mm-hmm. So just, and we've, we've been able to um, reach out to so many different families across the country, right, where... I have people who've written back to me from Gujarat, from Madhya Pradesh, from other parts of the country, just pouring their heart out and sharing their stories when we share content and where I, where, when I share my story, saying that it's just good to know that you're not alone, right? And just good to know, like, somebody somewhere is talking about it. So mm-hmm. I think that's been really nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're doing a beautiful thing, bringing people together, you know, especially... These days, um, as people are moving more to this kind of digital platform so that they can have that access whenever they want at their own time and reach more people. Um, So, yeah, I can imagine that you've heard a lot of stories from families and maybe self-advocates, other professionals, too. Um, Could you share with us something that maybe surprised, inspired or moved you? There are so many, you know. Um, I'll tell you something about um, a friend of mine who's on the spectrum. Um, He also writes content for us occasionally. And I reached out to him through, I don't even remember how, but we got in touch. And he's like, he's the most incredible individual I've ever met. And in the beginning, he was so shy about... um, expressing his thoughts so he always wanted to remain anonymous right so even when he would write a blog for us he'd be like no no I don't want to tell the world that I wrote it why don't you just post it anonymously and I said okay fine you know what we'll do it like that but eventually like slowly as his uh, blog reach increased slowly and I, I told him I was like you know Viraj why don't don't you want other people to get inspired by you and see that you're sharing this and why don't don't you want to instill confidence in other people who are on the spectrum to also come out there and share their experiences and then I've seen him change and become more confident about the way he writes, the way he speaks, you know. And I think he, is, he was extremely camera shy in the beginning. And then finally he came out and did a, did a video interview with us. It's such a small thing, but for me it's such a big achievement. Because from a guy who would not want to tell people his name, for him to go out in front of a camera and talk about like an experience was absolutely beautiful. So 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think just being able to do that makes me feel very, very proud of myself. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, so that was really nice. And of course, there are other stories that are extremely, extremely disheartening, but also inspiring in their own way, where this mother wrote to me from Gujarat and she told me that her family was on the verge of abandoning her because the, her child has autism, including the husband, including the brother, brother-in-law, everybody. And she was having a really, really hard time. Um, and then she, like her, so she wrote in her messages that her constant source of motivation was about uh, how my brother was growing and developing and like just hearing stories about other families really motivated her and gave her hope that, you know, mm-hmm. there's a future for her son as well out there. And, you know, in fact, we wrote like a really nice and long message for her entire family, sharing the most basic information, saying think, these are the things that you need to know. Maybe these are the things that will help you come to terms with what's happening, you know, just bringing some positivity to the whole situation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so many of these. Yeah. Speeches, so many of these. Yeah, you're instilling hope and you're empowering people and... Um, yeah, making them feel like they're not alone. Exactly. You know, it's, yeah. it sounds so like such a huge mission to change the attitudes and understanding in a country, you know, and as you were mentioning before, you have to start with education. People yeah. need to know what autism is. Um, where do you think that, like, what would be the first step in all of that? I understand, you know, You're doing what you can with Reservoir, but is there something that could be done in the education system at an earlier age? Yeah, I think more than anything else, if we can include this as a part of the education system, the education curriculum, for everybody, for every child, no matter where you are, right? Like everything else you learn in school, why isn't this taught in school, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right. if we can learn about it in a neutral, non-hostile way, I'm sure it'll be fine. And I feel like children are the best, are the most open-minded people anyway, right? It's when you grow up and you develop all of these biases and, you know, it becomes harder to sort of mold yourself and mold your thought process. But when you're young and impressionable, just hearing about this in the right way will make all the difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and about that that stigma that, people have you know what is it where do they think what do they think autism is do they understand it's a neurological disability or what's it like in India who knows who knows what these guys think Rachel <laughs> the, it, there are so many different of, uh, different reasons out there some of them think it's um, it's because um, of the mother of course mm-hmm. like that's the most common one that has to be there um, that it's the parents' fault, or the mother did something wrong. Then there are, I think genetic genetic part of genetics is the most common uh, underlying factor here. Because from my own experiences, the number of times we've been asked if I'm at a risk of having an autistic child in the future is just insane, right? Or the number of times my mom has been asked if this can other people in your family members have it? Can other family members have it? And my mom's like, sure. I mean. Just like I, my, my, my son has it, my other family members can have it, so can your family. Like, so it's just this, uh, I think there, are, there is a lot of um, misinformation around this topic. Mm-hmm. Do people think they can helpful. catch it too from other people, like it's contagious? I, I don't, maybe. You know, even if they're not saying it, it's like, it's like all of these, in their mind, they're just being safe, I guess, in a weird way because they think it's something that's harmful. Mm-hmm. Or something that um, they need to stay away from. So I guess it's that. Yeah. But also just, I think in India, everybody has like, you know, we just in general don't sort of appreciate um, differences in general. We're very uh, vocal about yeah. uh, about that. And of course, it's not everywhere. I'm not generalizing the entire country, but... Like in a in a very and I think again it stem it goes back to not knowing right when you don't know mm-hmm. about something you choose to like think about the weirdest things and mm-hmm. whatever comes to mind you feel like that's true yeah right. and this doesn't just extend with autism right 
or this doesn't just extend to autism. It also includes other types of disabilities, right? Like the stigma and people oh, not wanting to speak up about having a family member. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Like, in fact, I was talking to a friend of mine. She's a mother of a beautiful girl with Down syndrome. And we would discuss, so we actually made like a really funny video about this, about things that parents are tired of hearing or things that family members are tired of hearing when they see Nora. Because everybody would go like, oh, she doesn't look abnormal. Oh, she doesn't look disabled. Oh, she doesn't. Like, so just mm -hmm. people say the most insensitive stuff yeah. to you and like not realize what it can mean. Um, mm -hmm. But I think like the only thing that's really helped us is being like us having a positive outlook towards it. So I'll just give you an example. Every time uh, I used to go out into the park and somebody would make fun of us, I would in initially feel really, really bad about it. Mm -hmm. And then my mom said, why don't you tell them about it, right? Just tell them. And then you see what, what they say and what they do and how they behave. And I was shocked. I think that was like the earliest lesson that I learned about advocacy and awareness. Because the minute I told these young group of kids when I was, when I used to go to the park and told them that my brother has autism, he can't speak, but he's really good at kicking a ball and he's really good at cycling. This is, these are the things that he can do with us. You know, I think everybody went out of their way to help him, to, hmm. to like accept him, to, you know, I remember we would go pick, all of us would go to pick him up from his evening classes together. So just talking about it and when you put something out in the right way, it sort of helps people understand better. Mm -hmm. uh, even when we go to malls, even when we go to theatres, right? We always try and tell people around us. Before they make a face, before they assume the worst, we tell them that it's not anything bad, right? He just has autism. These are the things that you can expect, especially if we're going to be sitting next to you for three hours, you might as well know, right? Might as well learn. Instead mm -hmm. of just like feeling uncomfortable for three hours, making us feel <laughs> horrible for three hours. Just, I'll, I'll tell you about it. I'll talk to you. So yeah. I think that's that's gone a really long way for us in terms yeah. of us feeling very comfortable with ourselves. Just saying that, hey, listen, don't freak out. Don't get scared. He makes weird noises. He's very tall. Mm -hmm. But he means no harm and he's going to do no harm. So just relax. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I he really might like take that, your popcorn. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he might take your popcorn, but please, please <laughs> hide it or please keep it on the other side at your own risk. Yeah. So everything. And I, you know, mm -hmm. then you, you get, and then nobody's, then that crazy to still like, be like, oh no, we're not going to sit here. Because then you're mm -hmm. not that, like this thing, right? Mm -hmm. Then they have no option but to laugh about it and smile about it and be like, okay, no, it's fine. You know? Mm hmm Right, and but so it's, then you see. it's about giving the autistic community a chance to be in public, you know, yeah. and I think what you're doing and what you and your family are doing about um, educating people that you meet is a great start too, because they, they, like you said, they see you, they trust that you are just trying to protect your brother and, you know, being open to the possibility that they can understand and they can be accepting also. I wonder yeah. if some people just are afraid of what other people will say or afraid of that rejection. And so they don't take that chance of bringing their, yeah. their child to the store or to the park or to the theater. Okay, Shreya. So with Reservoir, with your organization now, have you tried to engage the mainstream media to call for more attention for your cause? Yes, I have. In fact... Via print, via the radio, via just doing events. We have tried to do that. Uh, and so far, it's gotten us a great response at almost all levels. Except for it's surprising about, you know, how many people who have an audience, who have people um, who would listen to them and who have the power much more than I do to change the mindsets of millions of other people don't actually talk about it, right? Mm. Like, I wish... Um, people were as open as my family and just go out there and tell the world with the same amount of pride that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, but surprise, I don't know why they don't do that. Um, just celebrities and artists who, you know, like they have a platform. Mm -hmm. Like, and for all other causes, including, you know, th there has been a complete shift in attitude towards LGBTQ mm -hmm. in our country now. And very recently, and to the fact where my mom also now talks about it like as a matter of fact, right? And I couldn't have imagined that five years ago or ten mm. years ago um, to have a conversation on my dinner table about just 
she'll where she'll ask me, oh, so you know, what's the what's the about the parade and you know what's why why is it pride and the flag and it's so it's catching it's catching momentum, but I think that's also because it got so much attention at all levels. There were movies around it. There, there was there were celebrities who were coming out and taking pride and talking about their identities. So it was it's a whole community that has come together, right, at all fronts to make this change. Mm-hmm. And I think that's sort of what we need, even for the neurodiverse community to happen. But because there's so much stigma around it, I think even for people who've done really well for themselves, they rather hide the fact that 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 they're neurodiverse just because they're afraid that it will bring them down. Which I sort of think defeats the whole purpose of not being able to celebrate who you truly are or who your who your family is, for that matter. You know. Mm-hmm. So, where do you see Reservoir in five years? Um, I think in five years, that's. It's something that I thought about very recently, is where, at least in all corners of a country, people should have access to information about autism and about neurodiversity, right? Even if I can't in the next five years make services accessible everywhere, at least information should be accessible everywhere, right? Nowhere should a person feel alone, alone and isolated, and sort of. Feeling caught at the hem of something, instead saying, "Oh, okay, I was feeling different. I have this information, and now this makes sense. Why?" Right. So just changing the way people look at this entirely throughout the country. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just you know, in fact, mm-hmm. even in bigger cities where I feel like as we advance towards a more inclusive community, I think inclusion needs to be a way of life. Right, it can't be that I practice it in my brother's school and I practice it in my own house. But when we're in a mall, we're gonna we're gonna isolate ourselves, and I don't know, you know. So I think just sort of make sure that all of these efforts happen at a parallel level, and as an ecosystem, support becomes much more accessible and help becomes much more accessible mm-hmm. in the next five years. Yeah. Well, Shreya. We're going to have to wrap up here in awesome. a few minutes, but you know, I just want to close with if you have any advice to other siblings of someone with disabilities who you know, might have been going through similar feelings that you were when you were an adolescent, for example. Uh, I mean, advice, I mean, my advice is that uh, like every other teenage thought that you have where you think your parents are wrong mm-hmm. <laughs> or that your parents are trying to like, you know, get after your life. Um, I think just just be more open minded about this, right? And I think if you're going to be open minded, if if you'll be open minded about this, you'll realize the benefits and the advantages, and of of just being around somebody who's so different than you and and everybody else. And I think that's what's made me into a more sensitive person. That's what made that is what made has made our friends into more sensitive people. Mm-hmm. Um, into and we've I think as as friends as circle we've become people who who sort of look beyond petty things and just love more, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. if if that's even a thing. But I think just an open heart is something that you'll receive with um, a sibling. So just have some faith, stick it out. I know it's tough because of course it's sometimes you will miss out on things. You will be um you know a part of things that you don't want to be a part of that's okay that's life if it wasn't this it would have been something else so don't blame your family don't blame, don't 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 take a step away cuz ultimately that's like really important and really beautiful yeah yeah <laughs> thank thank you shreya you know you're you're doing amazing work and the world needs more people like you really thank you rachel and i i hope every there are more people who Hear me out as patiently as you did, um, and mm-hmm. as your listeners probably will, and I think that will really help mm-hmm. in everything that we're doing. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. And I'll post your your links to your website and your YouTube videos on our show notes so people can follow Amazing. you. Amazing. Even if our videos are in, even if we're talking in Hindi, most of our subtitles are in English. Great. So basically, everybody can access them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Awesome. Thank, thank you, Shreya. 
Have a great Thank day. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much for this. Bye. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. I hope you found inspiration in hearing Shreya's message. Her wisdom definitely shines through her words and actions. I was really touched by the story she told of explaining what autism is to kids at a park. She let the other kids know that even though her brother can't speak, he can still do all these other fun things with them, and the other kids went out of their way to help and accept him. I'm reminded of the importance of educating young people about autism because that's really where inclusion begins. The youth are going to continue to build on the future we're creating for people of all differently abled backgrounds. Kids are so full of compassion. It's our job as adults to teach them how to show it. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.